Yeah, well, that's the title, and I'm Rob Shapiri. And um, this is all joint work with Stephen Phillips and uh, Miro Dudik. Um, and it also includes work uh, with or by Rob Anderson, Jane Aleth, Catherine Graham, Chris Raxworthy, the NC's working group, and on and on and on. Okay, so here's the problem that we're interested in. So the goal is to model the distribution of a plant or animal species. Okay, so, um, so here's what we're given. We're given a set of presence records. So each one of these little dots, each one of these little red dots, if you can see them, represents where a particular animal was seen. In this case, it was a bird called a yellow-throated vireo. So each one of those dots is a location where a yellow-throated vireo was sighted, where it was observed. Those are called the presence records. So we're given those. And we're also given a set of environmental variables. Okay, so these tell us for each point on a map things like how much it rains in a year, uh, the number of wet days in a year, the average temperature in a year, and so on. And so we get a set of these environmental variables. And the goal, oops, the goal, the goal is to produce a map of the range of the species. Okay, so the goal is to output a map like this one that says that this species, this bird, uh, prefers these areas, tends to prefer these areas. Or maybe these areas also might be suitable uh, habitat for this bird. Okay, so why are we, this is the problem I'm going to be talking about today. Yeah, so, right, so in a sense this is a bad example because uh, here there's something like 800 sightings, and so if you just kind of like blur your eyes, you can see where they like to live. Okay. But, the um, in the northwest? Yeah, in the, in the northwest, you're, the northwest you're decided that it's happening. Right, so there, so there are two points. So first thing, uh, most of the data sets that we're looking at are much, much smaller than this, maybe 20 to 100 points. Mm -hmm. And also we're interested in areas of suitable habitat, which would include areas like this, at least according to our model. Even though they don't actually live there, the biologists are actually interested in identifying the areas where they could potentially live, even though they don't live there, probably in this case because there are geographic barriers that prevent them from getting there. Or, well, it's also possible that the model is wrong, but. By the way, would the environmental variables, I, I, I'm trying to decide what your definition is, would they preclude, for example, presence records of another species, or that's okay to um, like maybe well, a predator in this case. Um, okay, so, so these are things that the biologists have gathered and identified as being useful. Okay. So, um, so in principle, you could be using information from another species. Okay. Um, uh, just using presence records from another species doesn't fit mathematically into our model, as we'll <coughs> see in a little bit, but you could probably munge it into one. Okay. Yeah. So, so, you know, we're just taking it that we're given these environmental variables. So the desired output is not where they actually live, but where they could live. Right. So we're, we're actually trying to model the potential range of the species rather than the actual range. Uh -huh. Okay, good. So, so this is a problem that we didn't make up. This is an actual problem of interest to uh, conservation biologists. So why do they care about this problem? as best as I can explain it as a non-biologist. So first of all, this is a very fundamental question in conservation biology because it's asking what are the survival requirements? In other words, what is the niche of a particular species? So it's just a very fundamental basic question that you would ask about a species. This is also a core problem in the conservation of species. So if you want to conserve a species, if you want to save an endangered species, the first thing you need to do is identify its requirements for survival. That's the first thing you need to do in order to figure out how you're going to help save it, help preserve its habitat. But it turns out, so these are kind of straightforward, but it turns out that this is also the first step in many biological applications. Uh, some of them are more obvious than others. So, uh, for instance, in reserve design, so a government says, well, we're going to set aside land uh, for a reserve, for a national park, and we want you, the biologists or the computer scientists, to figure out where the best place is for this reserve. 
So in doing that, what you want to do is you want to save as many endangered species as you possibly can. And the first step then is to identify what the areas of habitat are, what the suitable habitat areas are for the species that are most endangered. Okay, so doing that, the first step is to build a model like these. And it, these models actually have been used for that. Then you could try and do things like you could use these models to predict the impact of climate change. So the world is getting to be a warmer place. The climate is changing. Um, and uh, I don't know, am I far enough from Washington to say that? Or, you know. Anyway, uh, so, so it's getting to be a warmer place. So if you have a model of how the climate is changing and you have a model of, um, of uh, how, uh, of what the um, habitat is for various species, you can predict what the effect of the climate change will be on the, the land and these environmental variables and in turn what effect it will have on the species. But then there are these less obvious applications of this, which I'll talk about later. So biologists have used these techniques actually to discover entirely new species and they've also used it for clarifying the taxonomic boundaries between species. So I'll talk about that later in more detail. Okay, so my interest, I'm not a biologist, my interest is in machine learning. So why is this an interesting problem from a machine learning or statistical point of view? So one reason, first of all, is that there are no negative examples. Okay, so we only, by a positive example, I mean an example where you actually observe the species. And a negative example is where you don't see it. In other words, an absence record. And we, the biologists tend not to have negative examples, tend not to have these absence records. And one reason is, well, if you go out, um, you know, they go out to the field and they look for various species, they record the ones that they see, they don't record all the thousands of species they did not see at a given location, is one reason. Um, but also, also, they tend to be suspicious of these kinds of data because if you go out to an area and you sit there for an hour and you don't see a particular bird, it doesn't mean that that bird doesn't live there. It just means that you happen not to see it in the hour that you were sitting there watching for it. Okay, so they tend to be suspicious of absence records and tend to only want to use the presence records where they've actually observed a species. So that's one challenge. Another challenge is that we have very limited data. Oh, yeah, Jason. Yeah, so in any case, wouldn't uh, in a, a negative example for this problem be a place where they can't live as opposed to a place where they don't live? Uh, possibly, if you could figure that out. Yeah. Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, so, it, it, so it's even harder to come Right, up, but, right, exactly. I mean, your, your problem is to predict where they can live, not where they do live, right? That's true. Yes, that's an, that's an excellent point. Right. Okay. Um, okay, so another challenge is that the amount of data is very limited. So... The example I gave before, we had 800 data points. A more typical <coughs> data set would only have something like 20 to 100 records. And you might ask, well, why work with these little tiny data sites? Why, why are they so lazy? Why don't they just go out to the field and collect more data? And the reason is because they're most interested in the rare species. And for the rare species, it's hard to collect data. And so you just don't have that much data for these rare species. Also, a lot of the data is not systematically collected. They don't do a nice, even survey of an entire area. Instead, much of the data has been collected in more of a haphazard way. A lot of the data also comes from museum records or herbaria that have been sitting around for years or even decades. And again, you might ask, well, why bother using this bad data? Why not just collect good data? And it's the same reason that we're dealing with rare species, and so you need to deal with whatever data you actually have. And then a last problem is the sample bias problem, which is there tends to be a bias in the way that this data is collected. So the data tends to be collected in areas that are more accessible, places that are closer to roads, closer to cities, closer to airports, and so on. Um, in, in short, the places that are most accessible. And so we'll talk about that later. Okay, so. Um, Right, so that's the problem. And so now what I want to talk about is, at a high level, is what approach we were taken, taking. So what we did was we assumed that these presence records are actually coming from a probability distribution, which is representative of the actual population distribution of the species. 
and we call that distribution pi. Wow, this is a big screen. I have to really walk far to point to pi over there. And our goal then is just to try to estimate that probability distribution. And what we're do doing is we're using the maximum entropy approach. So, um, so what is the maximum entropy approach? Um, I'm uh, actually a little bit unsure about this since based on the talks that I've had all day, it seems like everybody knows maximum entropy here. But in case there's anybody that doesn't know maximum entropy, let me try and describe it in a couple slides if uh, it's okay to do that. So, um, so here's what, you know, in the context of this particular problem. So here's what our data looks like for some imaginary species, species X. So we have a set of records, presence records, where the species has been observed. This was the first place it was observed, the second place, the third place, and so on. And we have these environmental variables for each one of uh, these, well, we actually have it for every point on the map, and in particular, we have it for all of the places where the species was observed. So for the first place where it was observed, we see that the altitude is about 1,410 meters, and the July temperature on average is about 16 degrees centigrade, and so on. Same thing for the second record, the third record, and so on. So, um, so if you look at data like this, the first thing you want to do is take the average of these numbers, right? Kind of a natural thing to do. You know, we've got a column of numbers. What's the average of those numbers? Well, it's whatever, 1,327 meters. And similarly, we take the average of the July temperature. And then the next thing a statistics book would tell you to do is to compute the standard deviation and so on. So we can compute these statistics from the data. And we're used to thinking of these numbers as telling us something about the numbers that appear in these columns, right? Or telling us something about other um, records that we would get if we were able to sample more from this distribution. But in general, we're gathering a bunch of facts about, about this species. So uh, this data tells us that the average altitude is about 1,327 meters, and it tells us about the average July temperature and about the standard deviation. And there are many, many facts of this kind that we can infer from the data. So for instance, we don't have to stop with these. We could ask how many, what's the probability of the species living above, say, 1,100 meters? What's the fraction of the population that lives above 1,100 meters? Well, you can s estimate that from the data by looking at how often you observe the species living above 1,100 meters. And you could do it for how often it lives above 1,200 meters and how often the July temperature is above 15 degrees and so on. So the point is that we can gather many, many, many facts from this data. Now, as I said, we're used to thinking about these as telling us something about the numbers that would appear in a table like the one that I showed on the last slide. But in fact, each one of these facts is really telling us something about the true distribution. It's really telling us something about the distribution of this species across that map. It's telling us, for instance, the first one is telling us that um, whatever the distribution is, if you take the average altitude with respect to that true distribution, it's going to be about 1,327. And so on for each one of these. Each one is telling us something about it, the true distribution. So the idea is to find a distribution which satisfies all of these constraints. And as is commonly the case, there might be many distributions that satisfy all those constraints. So in the absence of any other information, principle of maximum entropy says that we should choose the one which is closest to uniform, the one which has highest entropy. The idea is that if you didn't have any other information about the species, the natural thing to do would be to put a uniform distribution on its population. So here we're looking for the one that satisfies the constraints and is closest to uniform. Okay. All right. So that, at a high level, is the idea of maximum entropy. So for the rest of the talk, the talk is in two parts, theory and experiments. So in the theory part, um, I'll talk about our, the version of Maxent that we've been using, which is Maxent with relaxed constraints. Uh, and um, 
the cameraman told me not to rub my beard like this. I have to stop doing that. Okay, so uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, new performance guarantees for maximum entropy that we were able to prove, which are useful even when you have a really large number of features or the kind of constraints that I talked about before. I'll talk a little tiny bit about algorithm and convergence, and then I'll get on to the experiments and applications. Okay, so um, here more abstractly is the framework. I want to go back and describe our framework more mathematically now. Uh, so again, pi is the true unknown distribution. And here's what we're given. We're given a set of samples. Okay, so the samples are coming from this distribution pi. Each sample is just xi. There are m of them. And they all come from some space capital X. Okay, so pi is a distribution on capital X. And we get m samples, iid samples from that distribution. The other thing we're given are a set of features. So there are n features. And each feature is just a real valued function on the space capital X. Okay, so, so to first approximation, you can think of these features as the environmental variables. Because an environmental variable is really a feature in this sense. So the capital X is going to be our map, all the locations on the map. The XIs are, of course, going to be the samples, the presence records. And, these, and an environmental variable is really just a real valued function over the space X, over the entire map. So an environmental variable is a feature, but in a second I'm going to change the kind of features that we're talking about. Okay, and the goal is to estimate this distribution pi, so to find a distribution pi hat, which is a good estimate of pi. So maybe I should, uh, is there any chalk? Chalk. I see a chalkboard. Hmm, no chalk. Okay. Hmm. All right. Well, try to remember that. I was just going to write down to help you remember that pi is the true distribution, pi hat is the estimated distribution. Oh, here are markers. I need to write. Oh, I can't write. Oh, I see. Oh, cool. Okay, here we go. So I was just going to write down pi is the true distribution, and pi hat is the estimated distribution. just to keep them clear. OK, and I should say, as I'm sure you all know, there's been a ton of work on maximum entropy. I'm not even going to attempt to survey it, but the framework we're taking is mainly from, from this work, from Della Pietra, Della Pietra, and Lafferty. OK, so how does this setup relate to the habitat modeling problem? So uh, again, as I already said, the XIs, the samples, are just the presence records. The space capital X is the space of all localities on the map. And we're assuming that this map has been discretized. In fact, the biologists have already discretized it. So we can assume that this space X is very large but finite, usually on the order of 10,000, 100,000 points, maybe a little bit more. And pi represents the true distribution of localities inhabited by the species. So and setting it up this way, we're making a lot of assumptions. So we're ignoring sample bias, right? We're ignoring bias that says that the biologists tend to look in certain areas more than others. And we're ignoring dependence between the samples. The fact that if you find a species here, you might wander over 20 feet and find another one really close by, for instance. I mean, they don't actually collect it that way. But, you know, you get that idea that the, the samples are not going to be truly independent. So we're ignoring that for the sake of tractability. OK, now what about these features? Now, as I said, these features could just be the environmental variables. So we could have features, say, if one feature was, which is equal to temperature and another feature which is equal to altitude and so on. We could just let the features be equal to the environmental variables. We would call those linear features. But you could do other stuff. You could start making up features based on the environmental variables that you already have. So we could 
add quadratic features, which are, so a feature which is equal to temperature squared or altitude squared. You could add product features, so a feature which is the product of temperature and altitude, temperature times altitude, which is kind of a weird thing to think about, but. Or you could keep going, you could add these threshold features. So this would be a feature which is equal to one if some environmental variable is bigger than some threshold and zero otherwise. So the feature is one if altitude is above 1,200 meters and zero otherwise. So the point is that by deriving or creating these features in this way, the number of features can become very large. In fact, it can become infinite very, very quickly. I mean, in this case, in this case, you actually have an infinite number of features because you have one for every possible threshold. So the point is that you can end up with many, many features very quickly. Okay. So, uh, okay, so a tiny bit more notation. So I'm going to write pi twiddle for the empirical distribution. This just puts probability 1 over m on each of the points that were observed in the sample and zero on all the others. Okay, so, oops, pi twiddle is the empirical distribution. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to use this notation that we didn't invent, but uh, I don't know if we're going to stick with it, but um, anyway, this notation pi bracket f which is expectation of f with respect to distribution pi. Okay, it's just expectation with the brackets. So in particular, pi twiddle of f, since pi twiddle is the empirical distribution, this is just the empirical average of a function f. Okay, the average over the training samples. Okay, so that's the setup. How are we going to do it? The goal, again, is to infer an estimate of the distribution pi. So the first idea you might have, naively, is to just use the empirical distribution itself as an estimate of pi. We need to remember that we're dealing with a space of 10,000 or 100,000 points, and we only have 20 to 100 samples. So this is going to be an awful estimate. It's going to give zero probability to practically every point in the space. On the other hand, the empirical average of any one of these features is likely to be a pretty good estimate of its true expectation. This is the true expectation of that feature. And this is just the law of large numbers, right? That averages tend to be close to true expectations. So the idea is to choose a distribution, pi hat, again, this is our estimate, so that that distribution has that property. So that when you take expectation with respect to that estimated distribution, it will be equal to the empirical average of each one of those features. Okay, and if you think about it, these constraints correspond exactly to the constraints, the facts that I talked about at the beginning. If we're talking about linear features, this says that the averages have to match. If you talk about quadratic features, that says the standard deviations have to match, and so on for threshold and product features. Okay, so in general, there might be many distributions that satisfy these constraints, and among all of those, we want to choose the one which is closest to uniform, the one that has highest entropy. Okay, an idea that goes back at least to Jane's, if not to Boltzmann. Okay, so the problem with this, well, there are a couple problems with this approach. The first problem is that this can really badly overfit, especially if you have a huge number of features right? And the second problem is that if you think about it, we expect the empirical average to be close to the true expectation, but here we're requiring that they're actually equal. So there's kind of a mismatch between the um, motivation for this approach and the way that we're actually carrying it out. And those two problems turn out to be related. Okay, so as I said, in general, we only expect the empirical average to be close to the true expectation, not to be equal to it. 
So, and what's more, we can usually upper bound the difference between the empirical average and the true expectation. We can use things like Hoofding's inequality or uh, whatever, Chernoff bounds, all kinds of methods for upper bounding the difference between an empirical average and a true expectation. So, so what we can do is we can relax the constraints that we're using to take that into account. So we can still look for a distribution pi hat, which maximizes the entropy, but now we can relax those constraints. Rather than requiring equality between these, we just require that the difference between the empirical average and expectation under the estimated distribution pi hat be at most some number beta j, where beta j is a known upper bound on the difference between, between this difference. Okay, and again, we can usually compute this difference or an upper bound on this difference. So that's the approach that we're actually using for this problem, to use this relaxed version of maximum entropy. Okay, so, okay, so this is a convex optimization problem, so it has a dual, so let's take a look at the dual. Okay, so first of all, the solution to that optimization problem has to have a particular parametric form. It has to be what's called a Gibbs distribution or an exponential family distribution. So the solution has to be equal to um, a distribution of a particular parametric form where the parameters are lambda, which is just in which the probability of a point x is proportional to e to a linear combination of the features at that point x. And the parameters are these coefficients lambda j. Okay, so it has to be one of those distributions. And in the unrelaxed case, the solution is a Gibbs distribution, and in particular, it has to be the Gibbs distribution that maximizes the likelihood of the data. In other words, the distribution that minimizes the negative log likelihood of the data. This is just the negative log likelihood of the data. That's in the unrelaxed case where you have equality constraints. If you add these inequality constraints, if you're working in the relaxed case, the solution is still a Gibbs distribution, but it minimizes a slightly different uh, objective function. So it minimizes the same negative log likelihood plus this additional term over here where beta j, again, are those upper bounds on the differences between empirical and true expectation, and the lambda j's are these same parameters. So this looks a lot like L1 regularization, right? So you can also view this as doing a regularized form of maximum entropy, or maximum likelihood, actually. It's really penalized maximum likelihood. Okay, so there three different equivalent motivations for what we're doing. One is maximum entropy with relaxed constraints. The other is log loss, or log maximum likelihood, log likelihood rather, with regularization. And the last is, uh, if you view things in a Bayesian setup, you can view it as finding the maximum a posteriori estimate with a Laplace prior on the lambdas. Okay. okay. All right, so that's, the um, setup, that's the algorithm we're using, yeah? Can you comment on why the solution to the original optimization problem has to be a Gibbs distribution? Oh, um, well, to show that you get a Gibbs distribution here, you, um, well, one way of seeing it is just to form the Lagrangian. You're just maximizing this thing subject to constraints, so you form the Lagrangian and then you take derivatives, set them equal to zero, and it works out to be a Gibbs distribution. Okay. Other questions? Okay, good. So that's, that's the approach we're taking to try and solve this relaxed maximum entropy problem. Okay, so how good is this, how good is this max end estimate? How good is this pi hat gonna be compared to the true distribution? So what we wanna do is we wanna bound the distance between our estimated distribution and the true distribution, right? And we'll use relative entropy to do that. So we're trying to upper bound the relative entropy between true distribution and 
pi hat, our estimated distribution. So what do we want our bound to look like or expect it to look like? Well, first of all, we're using a Gibbs distribution for our modeling task. We can never, so we don't expect to ever beat the best Gibbs distribution, which I'll denote by pi star. Pi star isn't exactly the best Gibbs distribution, but you can think about it that way. So, so we expect that this will be at most the distance between the true distribution and the best Gibbs distribution. The best one, the one which is closest to the true distribution pi. And then we'll have an additional term. I mean, this term you get, this is kind of the term you might expect to get if you had infinite amount of data. Or if you actually knew pi and you were just trying to find the best Gibbs distribution to match it. But we only have a finite amount of data, so we're going to get an additional term here. So first of all, we would like or we would expect that term to go to zero as the amount of data, m, goes to infinity. And we also expect that term somehow to depend on the features that we're using, either to depend on the number of the features or somehow on their complexity. And then we might also expect some kind of dependence on the smoothness of pi star, the distribution we're comparing to. Okay, so here's, here's an actual bound that we can prove. Yeah? Before you go, just back up one time. So, so pi star is basically the Uncons well, not unconstrained, it's the minimizer of the relative entropy between pi and pi hat over all pi hat of that form. That's the way I want you to think about it. But okay, it's but you're going to make it more precise. But, um, uh, yeah, okay. the, well, the words on this slide will make it, pre okay. Okay. Well, I can all make right. it precise. Good. Okay. Okay, so, yes. okay, so, um, right, so what we can prove is a bound that has exactly that form. Um, so again, here's the difference between our estimate and the true distribution. This is best Gibbs distribution and our distribu and the true distribution. And then we have this additional term. Now for the moment, just ignore this lambda star, L1 of norm of lambda star. So what you're left with, or think of it as a constant, so what you're left with is this additional term which has the form square root of log n, where n is number of features divided by m, the number of samples. So this is nice because it's saying that as the sample size grows, this additional term goes to zero at the rate one over m, one over root m. And also, this bound only depends on the log of the number of features. So it's saying that we can afford to really have a lot of features and still be able to do something reasonable here. Say the number of m features. m is the number of samples. And n is the number of features. Okay. But you have few samples, right? We have rel relatively few, yeah. So you can't afford much. We can't afford much, that's right. But fortunately, this is only logarithmic in the number of features. Now, okay, so if you, you know, 100 samples according to this bound might still not be enough. But it's still saying that at least qualitatively, we expect that the number of examples we need should depend more so on log of the number of features rather than, say, linear in the number of features. Okay, yeah, David? Presumably your high probability you would want to have some epsilon on the problem, on, the, on this bound that would make Oh, right, so there's, yeah, so this is, this bound, if you make it precise, would be with probability at least one minus delta yeah. over the choice of the sample, the random sample, and then there would be some term that's like log 1 over delta appearing in here somewhere. Right. Is there another question? Jason? Um, yeah, so you haven't told us yet how you use <coughs> betas, except you, you mentioned. Ah, so, except okay. by hand -waving, but so the beta j's can be set. Actually, let me come back to that. But in this case, you know, there's a formula you can write down in terms of n and m. So independent of j? Independent of j in this case. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so here practice, you just have you one beta, which is the same for all features. In, for, yeah. To prove this theorem, yes. Yeah. In practice, we actually do vary the betas by the features. Okay. Now, to make the bound more precise, what the bound is really saying is that um, pi star is a Gibbs distribution, as, and it's defined by a set of parameters lambda star. And this bound holds simultaneously 
for all pi stars defined by lambda star. Okay, and then you get a dependence on the L1 norm of the lambda stars. Okay? Okay, so that's for finite feature classes. In fact, you can even prove stuff if you have an infinite number of features. So, for instance, if your space of features is infinitely large as it is, say, for threshold features, but let's say that it's binary, so each one has a value which is 0 or 1. <coughs> in that case, we can prove a theorem that's very, very similar, but instead of log n over here, we would get something which depends on the VC dimension of that class of features. Okay, so the class of features would now form a function space, and so you can measure its complexity using VC dimension. And um, so, for instance, for threshold features, there are infinitely many threshold features, but as a function class, their VC dimension is quite low. So we can even afford to throw all those in. Okay, now both of those bounds are actually corollaries, very direct, easy corollaries of this one main theorem. So the theorem says that if, for every one of your features, beta j actually is an upper bound on the difference between true expectation and empirical average, then we can prove a bound like in the last case where the additional term is just 2 times sum over j of beta j times the absolute value of the jth lambda parameter. Okay, and once you prove a, this bound, then the previous bounds just follow by um, plugging in standard results for bounding the difference between empirical average and true expectations. The first one just used Hoechting's inequality with union bound, and the second one just used standard VC theory type results. Okay? And also it says that in practice, the way to set beta j is to set it to be the tightest bounds possible that you can on this difference. Right. Exceeding it over all of the features simultaneously. Right. Yeah. So in practice, what we do is we often, well, if, for instance, if you expect that um, the distribution over Fj will be normal, then you could just use some kind of normal estimates to upper bound this difference, for instance. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So what about an algorithm? Let me see. Uh, Am I supposed to stop at 530? Yeah. 530. Okay. Um, so, um, well, let me not, not talk much about an algorithm then. So basically, we want to, we're trying to minimize this function. And so you want to use an iterative approach to doing this. So you want to for, form a sequence of uh, lambdas, lambda vectors, lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, so that they converge to the minimum. So many algorithms for max n update all of the weights simultaneously, but we're trying to think of a case where you really have a very large number of features where that doesn't make as much sense. So instead, what we've been doing is to use a sequential update algorithm, which just updates one weight at a time. So at every round, you just choose a single weight and update it. And so this is kind of analogous to what's done in boosting. I don't know if people are expecting me to talk about boosting or not, but here it is. I'm mentioning boosting here. So it's a lot like boosting where you're also just choosing one in that case, you're choosing one weak classifier, weak hypothesis to update on every step. Here, you're choosing one feature and updating its weight, but it's really very analogous. Yeah? Maybe I didn't understand the sparsity properties that you were talking about. So your features are not sparse across uh, for each sample. So the I mean, is it usually what you, you I mean, the usual online algorithms that you're used to for problems like this are exponenti exponentiated gradient descent where because the features are sparse for any given example, you just update all the features that fire on yeah. uh, that particular example, but that's not the case. So boosting is kind of the dual of that, where, you, where you're just updating, where you have all the examples at once, and you're just updating a single one on every round, a single feature. You're updating just one feature, one weak classifier in that setting. So here we're doing the same thing. We have all the data at the same time, rather than getting it one at a time or we're just updating one of those weights at a time. Okay. In, um, yeah. and the sparseness might come from the fact that 
there might actually have been a large number of, let's call them equivalent features, meaning like because your data is so sparse that there are many features, well, let's say, which are all one okay. or all zero. So there's yes. sparseness in what, okay, so here I'm saying it leads to a sparser solution just yeah, because if you do this for a hundred steps, right. and then stop. only only a hundred features are going to have non-zero right. weights okay. just automatically. Right. But then there's also the question of, well, do you expect the solution, the real solution that you're aiming for, actually to be sparse? And so that's actually a separate part of the theory, and that's kind of coming out from the fact that in these bounds way back here, oops, in these bounds you have this dependence on the L1 norm of lambda star. So if lambda star tends to be sparse, you know, if lambda star is really a good solution and it's sparse, then this part of the bound will be better. Okay, so they're kind of two separate things that are somehow related. Good, other questions? Okay, oh, let me mention um, some extensions of this work. So first of all, it's been generalized quite a bit. So we talked about L1 regularization. It's been generalized to L2 and L2 squared regularization, which correspond to other constraints on the means or the empirical averages of the features. Uh, so that's one direction. Another direction where we've ex uh, extended this is to where you have hierarchical information. So in this setting, the species are often already arranged in a natural hierarchy. So, you know, they're grouped as birds. Here's a group of reptiles. Here's a group of nocturnal animals. Here's a group of animals that, you know, live in the upper story of a rainforest, and these live in the lower story, and so on. So there's, there are these natural hierarchies or groupings of the species. And we've already seen how we might have very limited data for individual species. But it's often case that the biologists are looking at many species at the same time, in which case you might be able to leverage the fact that you have all these different groupings of the species. And so uh, we've extended the work to use this hierarchical information to improve performance for species where you have limited data for the individual species, but <coughs> somehow you can um, use the fact that you're modeling several of them together. Okay, so that's it for theory. So now what I want to do is talk about experiments and applications. <coughs> so I'll talk about a broad comparison of algorithms that was done on this problem and some improvements we got by handling sample bias. Uh, I won't have time to talk about the case study, but I'll talk about two other applications of this. Okay, so there was this big bake-off that was done uh, organized by a group called NCs. It was led by Jane Ellith and Catherine Graham. And uh, it led to one of those great papers that I always wanted to be on where there are like a hundred different authors, you know. And so, so I'm now uh, author number 23 on a paper with 27 authors, which is very exciting for me. You know, you, you get to add like a whole section to your CV, right? What? This is alphabetic, guys. Alphabetic? Uh, uh, the first, right. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So the first two authors were not alphabetic, but you're right, the others were. So anyway, so there was this bake-off comparing 16 different methods for the problem. Uh, there were 226 plant and animal species from six regions of the world. Um, and you can read some of the statistics. So the median data set had about 58 presence records. So they were relatively small. And the way it was set up was very nice because the training data was the kind of incidental, non-systematic, presence-only data that the biologists actually want to work with that they've gathered from museums and herbaria and so on. But the test data, test data was systematically collected and consisted of both presence and absence data. Okay, so it's kind of a test of how well can you do just using the crummy data that we actually have to work with? So uh, here's a comparison of uh, six of the 16 methods. Um, so the best methods, oh, oh, I'm measuring AUC, area under the ROC curve, whatever that is. All you need to know is that higher is better for this. Um, so the best methods were uh, actually boosted regression trees and then maximum entropy and then uh, 
<coughs> some statistical methods, generalized dissimilarity models. A GARP was a method that was uh, widely used by biologists. It's actually a genetic algorithm. And BioClim is a very simple kind of convex hole algorithm that, uh, uh, that was also widely used by biologists. So, yeah. Um, did all of these methods use the same features and derived features and so forth? Probably not, right? They all had access to the same set of environmental variables. Yeah, right, so, but it could be that the but difference it, between two of these models that one of them threw in the product, threw in the product features and one of them didn't. Right. That's in other words, we don't know if the issue is the underlying method. Yeah, or not all of them use features at all. Like BioClim, yeah. I don't think, uses features or environmental variables. It's kind of the algorithm that was suggested at the beginning of just kind of blurring your eyes, so mm -hmm. sort of, not quite. But um, <coughs> yes, yes, you're right. So that could be a, a confounding factor in, in comparing these. That's true. So, but what is true is that each method was worked on by its strongest proponent. Exactly. So they did the best thing. That's exactly it. right, yeah. Okay. That's exactly right. So, um, so one thing that came out of this is that the, the kind of newer statistical and machine learning methods, including MaxEnt, uh, tended to perform better than the more established methods, the ones that the biologists had been using. Yep. Is it this is the, yeah, the version that I was describing, the relaxed maxim, that's right. Mm -hmm. So what's a statistically significant difference? Right, so uh, that's a good question. I think that between here and here is statistically significant, so, but I'm not. So like a full percentage point. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and also this kind of indicates that it's reasonable to use presence only or incidental data. Now, um, let me skip that. So one of the things that came out of this work is that, why are you laughing? I just like the timing. Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, the problem with Canada, yeah, so no offense to any Canadians here, you know, Canada's a great place. Um, but um, yeah, the results for Canada were by far the weakest. Uh, so in blue, we've got the average of all regions, and in magenta, we've got, uh, the average of just the species from Canada. Okay, so the Canadian results for all of the methods except for BioClim uh, really took a huge hit in going to Canada. And the problem seems to be sample bias. There seems to be very bad sample bias in Canada because in Canada, people tend to sample in the south where it's warmer and there are cities and so on rather than in the freezing cold north. So what can we do about that? Well, we can modify MaxEnt to handle sample bias. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, <clears throat> suppose that we actually knew the sampling distribution, the distribution that the biologists are using to sample, uh, to go out and look for these species. Well, what we can do is we can use that sampling distribution as our default distribution. So rather than trying to find the distribution which is closest to uniform, we try to find the distribution which is closest to this sampling distribution. Because if you're building a model of the data you're seeing and you haven't seen any data, then you'll expect that the samples will come from, have the same distribution as the sampling distribution. And then it turns out if you do the math that you can just factor the bias out from the final model. When you get done, you can just factor out the sample bias. Just get rid of it after you've built your model. The problem is where to get the sampling distribution. How can we assume that we have the sampling distribution? So, I guess so I know what you mean. So what you say is the Gibbs model you had earlier was e to the lambda i of i. Right. Now you'll have some z of x times or r of x times e to the lambda i of i. Exactly. Of x. That's what it will and work out to be. And when you finished estimating your lambdas, you'll throw away the r and just. Use that's it. exactly right. All right. Yep. Okay. So where do we get this sampling distribution? Well. That's not obvious, but typically, as I mentioned, we're modeling many species from the same area at the same time. So for the sampling distribution, we can just use all the locations where any species was observed. So we can assume that if you take all locations where the animal was, where any animal was seen, that that's a pretty good proxy for where the biologists actually looked for the species. And so we can... Sorry? Uh, 
You make those all equally likely under the sampling distribution. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that one's a little less obvious than the judgment call. Uh, uh, well, what do you mean by so we um, so if a point was observed at all, then we give it uh, unit weight. Right, I understand. So if it's been there, seen there five be times, which uh, are very rarely visited. I mean, the true distribution probably is not uh, probably doesn't look like the one that you're uh, estimating in this way. Um, well, it's kind of assuming that if you go out and look anywhere, well, you write down everything that you see there. Yeah, and so you're likely to see at least one thing. Now you're right; it's a right, tenuous assumption. Right, there might be several biologists who visit the same location. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a tenuous assumption, absolutely. That's, yeah, I mean, I wonder if you could, uh, if if you could learn it, be able to do something better with the data. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, I have some feeling that maybe you could, but I, I can't put my finger on it. Yeah, out. yeah. So yeah, so I'm sure there's smarter things to do than what we've done. <laughs> I mean, we're just we're taking first steps on this problem, and so I'm sure there's smarter things that could be well, done. Well, do in particular, do you know uh, for the different samples uh, who wrote down the sample? Um, I don't know if we could. So get you could that. you could do this per investigator or per trip or something mm -hmm. like that, uh, yeah. and then you would see that uh, there was there was only one person who wrote down any species in the area. There were ten people who wrote down species in the area. Uh huh. So you know, it was visited more. Often. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, question, sir. Which is that are you including the species whose uh, whose range you want to find in your any species? Yeah, we are. So if there was one dominant one, you'd be sort of cheating for it because you'd know that. Not cheating, you'd be biasing, actually. Um, if it's cheating, yeah, it hurts you true. in the end. But. That's true. And I'm not sure if that could hurt you or not. Yeah. No, it, exactly. It's not clear to yeah. me whether it'll help or hurt. But it's definitely biasing it. But actually, if there was one dominant one, so if you went somewhere and you only saw this one and you didn't see the other ones, that's almost a negative example. Mm -hmm. So in some, in some sense, if there's a dominant one that you see in lots of different places and you didn't see the other ones there, that's even stronger. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, so in any case, yeah, I'm sure there are other things that you could try. So, but in any case, this seems to help a lot. So on the Canadian data, Maxent without debiasing, again, gets an AUC of about 0.582. And with the debiasing, you're getting really a very substantial improvement in performance. And you get an uh, improvement in performance for all the areas. This is the same thing, but for all regions of the world, not just Canada. OK, so um, let me, uh, oh boy. OK, well, let me talk about one of these applications anyway. And then I should be able to stop. Um, so this was an application that was done by Chris Raxworthy, who's a biologist at the American Museum of Natural History in New York that he did with a group of collaborators. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I wasn't involved in this work. Uh, but he used maximum entropy to actually discover entirely new species that had never been seen before. So how did he do it? He's an expert on reptiles, particularly reptiles of Madagascar. So he started out by building models of several geckos and chameleons of Madagascar. So here's an example of one. And each of these species had about 10 to 20 presence records. So for this particular gecko, uh, each of these stars, if you can see them, are the actual presence records. And then he ran Maxent on those presence records and ended up with a model like this one indicated in this orange. So if you look at this model, or actually better if a biologist looks at this model, they would say that these predictions are pretty reasonable up in here where the species has actually been observed. But then you also get areas like these where Maxen is predicting that the species should be able to live, but nobody's ever observed it there. This is what the biologists call areas of overprediction. They say it's overpredicting. So Chris Raxworthy's idea was to do this not for one species, but for several species. And for each one, by hand, he identified these areas of overprediction. Then he took a union of all those areas of overprediction 
and ended up with a map like this one of Madagascar showing all the areas of overprediction for these species. Now, what he's looking for, what he's looking for is what the biologists call areas of local endemism. So these are geographically isolated, geographically local areas where you tend to find a very rich diversity of life. And he's expecting that these areas which were, have been identified using this process will be areas of local endemism in this way. And in fact, the ones that were indicated with arrows, the ones indicated with arrows are areas that are already well-known areas of local endemism on this island. All sorts of species would be viable, is that right? Where, so these are areas where at least one of uh, these geckos or chameleons should be viable according to this model, but have never actually been observed. So, but it's only geckos. I thought we're talking about all sorts of other species. I thought you said. Well, he, he, he was just, well, the approach works for anything, but He's an expert on reptiles, so he applied it just to geckos and chameleons. But many different kinds of geckos, isn't it? Yes. Oh, that's what it is. Right. I get, I mean, to me, a gecko is a gecko. <laughs> 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 you probably can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, in fact, until now, I never even knew there was a gecko. <laughs> <laughs> I was confused whether these were intersections or unions of these um, areas of prediction. These are uh, yeah, unions yeah, actually. Actually, he's color-coded by how many in each of these regions. But you probably can't see it from back there. I can barely see it up here. Right, because I was wondering, I, I would, would have thought that it would be the intersections that would lead you to predict what I kind of local endemism. That yeah. There are lots of different species well, that you would predict to be viable in those Yeah, places. you can kind of get union. If you, if you look up close, like down here is colored red, which indicates that actually all six of these geckos and chameleons should be found here but are not. Okay, so, yeah, so maybe you could use the color coding in some way, but. Okay, anyway, as, as, as I said, each one of these arrows indicates well-known areas of local endemism, and, but there are all these other areas with these question marks, which the model seems to suggest might be areas of local endemism, but have never been surveyed by the biologists. So, he actually went out to the field and surveyed these areas, and he came back with a huge number of new species. So these are two entirely new species never seen before. Um, and um, I don't know the actual number of how many he found, but the last time I talked to him, he estimated that there were something like 15 to 30 new species that they discovered in this way. <laughs> this is a snake. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. This one actually looks like a lizard, but right? now you're really pushing my biology. <laughs> what? Did he find snakes there? <laughs> 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 no, no, I'm serious now. Okay. Why did he find snakes? Because he's a herpetologist. Okay, so, he's, he, so the theory is that these are areas where you expect to find a rich diversity of life. You know, not just geckos and chameleons, but, but areas, these areas that you tend to find a diversity of many different kinds of animals. Okay. But uh, the reasons that geckos may not be observed in, in those isolated areas uh -huh. might be that there is some barrier there. Exactly. There is some barrier which does, doesn't allow exactly. a gecko to go. Exactly, but it, it, means, it means that it increases the possibility of there being closely related species that would be living there. That's exactly right. But that, but are there separate species because they've been isolated from each other? Yeah, yeah Jason. I, I mean, between there is a gecko eating the <laughs> animal. <laughs> no, no, no. That's why the gecko. Right, or there could be mounds or something. Yeah. yeah. Jason. Well, well, we're asking about the biology. Um, do the environmental variables include uh, things like uh, terrain, forestation, and stuff, and human habitation? Uh, I, I can imagine I that all I these places that were I mean, being predicted, uh, where there weren't any geckos, there were cities. Uh, right. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly what he was using for this. Or a gigantic lake. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. 
right. I'm and the see. examples you gave were things like altitude and, uh, right. and, and right. temperature. Um, so forest the cover, I believe, is typically used. It is. But, um, okay. I'm not sure how many what base variables used are in particular for this. I'm sorry? Do you remember how many base variables there are? I'm just curious. Environmental variables? Yeah. Um, I know well, typically there are 10 to 20. 10 to 20. In the 10 to 20 range. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know the details of what he used. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm over. So let me just summarize. Um, so maximum entropy provides very clean and effective fit to this problem. It works with positive only examples. I should have said on that list of 16 different methods, there were only two that were designed specifically for positive only data, this one and uh, GARP. Uh, it seems to perform well with a limited number of examples and we have some theory to say that it works even when you have a very large number of features. <coughs> uh, it's got some other nice properties. I didn't talk about this, but it's fairly easy to interpret by a human expert. I know that's subjective. Um, and it can be extended to handle sample bias and also it's got a bunch of biological applications that well, I talked about one of them. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Yeah. Do you think the distributions might change over time based on the migration patterns or something? Uh, because right now you're assuming a big distribution over all the periods of the year or whatever. Right, right. right. Yeah, so they, yeah, so certainly they would change seasonally. And so that would be something that care would have to be taken in preparing the data. So you're only using locations, you know, summer locations for species that migrates or winter locations and so on. Yeah. There's also the problem that the habitat itself is changing and some of the records are quite old. And so areas that used to be forest are now, you know, a shopping mall or something. And so, so that's another issue that needs to be dealt with in some way so that you can still use that data. Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, it's hard. Uh, if you have, so in a lot of our experiments, we only have a batch of data. So we'll use cross validation to, um, uh, we hold out part of the data and then you measure the AUC or you measure the log likelihood of the other data. Um, it's hard to get good confirmation. That's why these NCs experiments were really nice. Those are probably the best, most thorough experiments that I know of for doing that. But it involves actually going out to the field and doing a very complete survey of a region. So it's very expensive. Yeah. How much of the surface of the maximum is relaxing the constraints? Oh, how much is the performance dependent? I'm sorry, can you ask again? You relaxed the constraints. So what is the effect? Um, well, does it make a um, difference in the result? It does make a big difference. It depends on the features that you're using. So if you already have a fairly small number of features, it probably doesn't matter so much. Um, for other ones, it, for instance, if you throw in all the threshold features, then um, you really do see a lot of overfitting without any kind of um, relaxation. So, um, so the performance, um, yeah. So I, I didn't have, I actually don't even have slides on it, but we did do experiments where we varied <coughs> um, beta, where beta is controlling your upper bound on uh, the difference between empirical and true expectation. And um, for, for many of the feature sets that we've looked at, you really do get the, so no regularization would be beta equals zero. Our theory would say beta should be equal to one or something like that if you normalize things right. And so in many of the cases, you actually do get a very U-shaped kind of performance where you gain the best performance uh, somewhere close to the theoretical bound in some of the cases, not all of the cases. So, so we actually are, yeah, I didn't have slides on that, but. I guess the alternative but to regularizing would be to throw away features where mm -hmm. you don't trust mm -hmm. your 
by tilde, let's say. Yeah, so doing more of like feature selection. Right, right. so I guess that would, I, I thought that's what Vatsla was asking, that if you ran with a subset of your oh, I final see. set of features, carefully ablating those whose yeah. in, in, right. in fact, this regularization method decides which features to throw away, right? Because uh, it'll end up getting a feature vector with sparse support. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. uh, that depends on the algorithm, I suppose. Well, it'll, yeah, so this is this issue about sparsity. So in a sense, yes, it is, because if you don't run it for too long, then most of the features will be non-zero. Um, actually, you're doing L1 regularization, so that in itself, even if you keep That's running, right. will tend to lead to a sparse solution. Yes. Yeah, so in that sense, you're also doing a kind of feature selection. But yes, an alternative is to use another method to pre-select features. Right. Yeah? Uh, have you compared, uh, for example, L2 regularization? Uh, we have not ex experimented with L2 regularization. Well, a lot of our theory covers L2 regularization. I don't think we've actually tried it. Though. Okay. Good. Thanks a lot.